Hi, everyone, and welcome to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. Wendy has spent the last two years helping women with various stages of endometriosis to heal naturally after putting her condition into remission. After her own healing success from stage four endometriosis and adenomyosis, she's inspired to heal others, and her goal is to help some of the 175 million women know that there is another way other than painkillers, drugs, or surgery. This is the place to be for real talk with real people for real results so you can learn how to heal your endometriosis naturally. Please note that the opinions expressed in this program may represent options but are not a substitute for proper medical care. Before starting any new healthcare program, we recommend you consult with a health professional. I'm absolutely delighted, Tony, for, for you coming and agreeing to this interview with me. Uh, my name's Wendy Laidlaw and I'm interviewing Dr. Tony Coop. Um, who I have known for a couple of years now um, and I had the great pleasure of speaking to um, probably about three or four years ago I think when I was very ill and you were a breath of fresh air uh, who I spoke to was very kind very caring very considerate about where I was at and, um, and I had a wonderful refreshing outlook to how I could help myself and um, I wonder you know you might maybe just tell us a wee bit about your background really of, of being a doctor Right. Um, well, my father was a doctor and um, he came from a classics background as well. So I had a fairly broad sort of start in my infancy, really. Yeah. Um, and I looked at other things, but in the end, I wanted to do something worthwhile. So I thought, well, I, yeah, I, better, I better go this route. Um, when, I, when I got into university um, and college, um, it was very apparent to me, even then, that medicine was a, a strange sort of creature because we, we could tell down to the last molecule how things happened, but there were so many, so many instances where, you know, we weren't told why. And uh, in medicine, there's a, a word, iatrogenic, which means illnesses caused by doctors or caused by medicines. And then there's uh, the other one, is it idiopathic, which is... We don't know how, what, what the cause of this, and there's an awful lot of those, and there still are. Yeah. They're not actually labelled idiopathic now, but you know, it's just not talked about where, where the cause of things. So um, that got me curious, and for that reason I decided I, I really didn't want to stay in hospital. I did three years in hospital, so the, the general practice was the preferred route. And um, when I got there, of course, you know, for the first five years, we were busy doing sorting out practices and things like that. But it became gradually dawned on me that this was a very different thing out in general practice, that chronic disease was very much more, uh, it was 90% of the work, really. Yeah. Um, and no one had really mentioned this sort of thing. Um, and it was always a question of why, you know, why? So... Um, what to say about that really it it I feel I've sort of been led from one thing to another just by looking at what was in front of me and trying to make sense of it basically yeah well it's it's great even just to hear you talking you know the how curious you were from the beginning because the most inspiring doctors that I've read you read their books or or, or spoken to have been the ones that have thought outside the box you know not just um taken in the information that they've been taught through their training, but they have taken that in, but also thought on a wider perspective as well, you know, encompassing like the, the, the full person and that whole curiosity as to well, why. And, and there's a lot of people out here out there that don't do that. But what, what kind of like, so you're in general practice, you, you've been a doctor for, for how many years now? Uh, ooh. <laughs> Since 1972. Right. Actually, before that, because I qualified in 68, but obviously I was in hospital before that doing sort of house jobs. All right, excellent. So that's a long time. It's what, is it 40 years or is it more? Is it 45? Well, I'm 47. I was born in 68, so like 47 oh. years. Yes, right. Yes, so it is about that. Nearly yeah. half a century. Unbelievable, isn't it? So you must have seen quite a change then in, in, that, in that time. Uh, huge, yes. I mean... The only negative things that I was aware of, and one has to be make allowances for you know one's own naivety, was that whereas there were 
there was sniping, and, and I'm talking about hospital situation, there was sniping between consultants and departments, and there was sniping at GPs particularly, you know, as being really rather a sort of low life yeah. um, and didn't know very much. But um, that changed. Do you think? I don't think that's changed. That, that hasn't changed. I don't think that's changed. But but what was there was a sense that everybody was on the same side, looking for the truth. Yeah. Really, of things. Yeah. And so there was this curiosity, and uh, but that seemed that's what seems to have changed. I think the thinking has changed, and it's. Uh, and what, what it, do you think? What do you think has caused that change in thinking? Do you think there is anything to do with the pharmaceutical? Um, giants, these companies, do you think that has altered the mindsets? I think it's if something's repeated enough and um, other stuff isn't spoken about, it gradually takes over. I think we've seen this in politics, we've seen it in, in life really. Yeah. Um, Before you know it, it becomes the norm and, and people don't even know that there is a way right. spread. That's right. And medicine has a strange uh, tendency to seize on some some something which is taken as the truth and yeah. once it's taken as truth it's unbelievably difficult to actually go back to the beginning and actually rethink a thing That's right. so um i mean the thing that i give you an example the thing that was really apparent to me was and really outstandingly uh, outstanding was that i met a couple of doctors when i was a houseman who were very interested in psychosomatic medicine now uh, they would consider illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis, heart attacks, coronary heart disease, um, autoimmune disease, various other things, and asthma, as being um, a lot of the time very much psychologically based, emotionally based. Mm. And there were a lot of papers about this. And this was very exciting to me. It really sort of struck a chord. My instinct told me this was true. Um, but 45 years later, they still don't talk about it. You know, it hasn't, it, apart from the odd department of psycho and neuroimmunology, which looks at these things, yeah. um, it's almost dismissed. And even the alternative, I mean, there's a huge movement in America at the moment around integrative and functional medicine, which is much broader than mainstream medicine as we know it. Yeah. But they still, I mean, they'll talk about stress, but they don't talk about the specific, the specificity of, of illness and where it comes from. Yeah. Um, and do you think, I mean, just to kind of reassure the women that might, might be listening to this, I think, I know I struggle with this. I think a lot of women in particular with endometriosis, it takes, it takes them sometimes decades to be diagnosed with, with their condition. Mm -hmm. I think on average it's eight years, that the statistics say, but you've got women who can repeatedly go to their hospitals or their doctors and get told that there's nothing wrong with them. It's all in their head. So to hear you kind of talk about the somatic side um, I mean, obviously, that is something that is beyond their awareness, beyond their control, that is, you know, um, built into their, their nervous system, perhaps from, from a younger age. Is that what you're meaning? Yes. Um, it's very easy, and doctors do this, but it's very easy for patients to do it to themselves, is to blame themselves for, for their illness. Yeah. You know, it's like all in your head. You mean you're imagining it? Yes. Well... <laughs> Uh, as though stress doesn't have uh, many, many physiological um, effects, which eventually, I believe, and I'm absolutely convinced of this, um, will change your physiology on one, after a while. And if your physiology changes, it changes uh, how your body expresses in terms of its physicality. So uh, there's a definite link between... Um, and there's a trap here, because you might say, well... What I, does what I think create what what I am? But it's deeper than that. It's uh, we our thoughts are really only echoes of what our beliefs are deep inside, which we're unconscious of mostly. That's right. Um, so it's an unconscious process. Yeah. And um, there's a wonderful book called The Healing Power of Illness, which uh, by a chap called he's a German spiritual psychologist. All oh, right, I've not heard that book. No, it's excellent, and. Um, he shows how psychological, emotional stuff, yeah. uh, if suppressed and not expressed, um, eventually can turn into not just physiological illness like asthma or irritable bowel syndrome or whatever, but, but something physical yeah. like cancer or, or uh, a nasty rash. Um, and uh, 
Yes, I, I can give a, I, just another example has come to me where when I first got this idea, I th tested it out in general practice and a woman came in um, while I was thinking about this and with a child who was about five or six who had had recurrent ear infections. Yeah. And I'd asked her several times whether there was anything going on in the, her life which was stressful. She said, oh, no, 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 I'm fine. Yeah. Um, and then I somehow had a little inspiration to ask the question in a different way. So I said, so what is it in your household that this boy doesn't want to hear? <laughs> Fantastic. And she burst into tears. <laughs> oh, bless. Um, and she related the picture of this small child holding onto the banisters in the landing above while the parents argued about all sorts of things underneath because their relationship was falling apart. Right. So that was such a strong example. Yeah. Um, that, that's and then it. as a result of you highlighting that issue, did, um, did, was there a resolution of, of the ear infection or the ear? Well, problem? yes. Um, I mean, obviously this child has got some damage and there was a tendency uh, to, for that to be repeated, but I don't remember seeing her after that um, mm -hmm. for any more than about once, I think. So, so yes. When you, so when you talk somatically, for those who don't understand the word somatically, um, how, how would you explain somatic? Somatic. Um, well, a psychosomatic illness is, is something that comes from the psyche, from the subtle um, from the mind or, or the thoughts or the feelings, uh, and is converted into soma, which is matter. Right. So it's from subtle to the material. Um, and these are things, again, that people, I think, uh, in, in my learning, my journey uh, has been mind-blowing, pardon the pun, but mind-blowing just kind of how much, you know, our subconscious mind, which is like 95% of, of our brain, you know, obviously we, we can only really willfully control 5% of our conscious mind. And then we have these layers upon layers of like, snowflakes and the snowdrift of what you know has been embedded in our nervous system from what we've seen observed felt heard from mm. the moment we were born mm. uh, and that conditions our thinking and our feeling and our beliefs and then they manifest themselves and show up in our body and i think it's that that jump from the thoughts the feelings the subconscious into how it manifests itself in our body i really really struggle with that and i struggled with that because i thought um, certainly some of the practitioners that I came across, the consultants and doctors, were incredibly arrogant, pompous, and very much, uh, it's just, this, they were saying to me, it's just a state of mind. You just need to, you know, get yourself up and out. And, and, and I'm like, if it was down to willpower, I wouldn't be bed -bound. You know, I wouldn't be in this condition because I can, would willfully try and soldier on. And again, that's a big thing with women with endometriosis. It's not that the aren't strong or you know determined or willful because sometimes the pain they, they've had to endure for decades you know they, they have to actually almost fight through that pain but then this concept of that wow there's other things going on below the surface that are out with your your control and they're manifesting themselves in your body is quite a big leap have you found that quite hard for people to kind of yes it is it, it is it is um I find that I tend to draw an iceberg diagram about this. Yeah. Um, take a triangle and uh, you put a little line right at the top and there's a tiny bit showing above the surface of that line and all the rest is hidden underneath. And at the top is our little consciousness, you know, uh, your brain and mine, um, our mind, if you like, which is capable of really one thought at a time. You know, if you're a woman, you might be able to do more than that, but... <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> but mostly... <laughs> it's one one thought and so whatever's going on underneath which is all the beliefs that have been, we've, we've downloaded in the first three to seven years of our lives when we're in a sort of meditative state we just download as a small child in small child mm -hmm. and our reality becomes uh, our, our acceptance of reality comes from that yeah um, and of course we've got all these mirror neurons as well so we just you know take on behaviors thoughts feelings because well we everything everything what's uh, what we're told what, what we make of it it's not just what comes in it's how we interpret it that's right and, uh, we can be left with an attitude to the world that it's safe or that it's dangerous and yeah. uh, so you, know, you begin to see how anxiety can just start from almost nothing um 
our parents' role models, our religion, our culture, all this stuff, and all the emotions. So that's just the beliefs, you know, the thoughts, which, which then come out as thoughts because our, our thinking is then con constricted by that, yeah. defined by it, really. That's right. um, and they say that, you know, most of our, the things that we think are really um, not original at all. You know, they've come from somewhere else, which is true. Uh, and of course, the other thing, which is even more powerful than that, is, is the emotions that we've felt that we've not expressed. The word emotion means, a, from the Latin, a motio, means to move out. So all our emotions were designed to feel all emotions, yeah. whether it's anger or sadness or whatever, and express them, and then they're gone. But if you can't do that, it's not safe to do that, then they remain in our body as some sort of hidden energy. Mm. Um, and we can feel it because our bodies gradually contract and constrict. We yeah. start to get blockages. The whole acupuncture theory is based on blockages of energy flow. So if things aren't flowing, we get uh, eventually physical disease. Yeah. Um, but what's very interesting is um, I, I went out to India about 20 years ago and came across some of their philosophy. This was a yoga. And uh, they described what's in our subconscious as samskaras, which is interesting because the word scar comes from that. Yeah. It's a Sanskrit word. And the word scar um, tells us that an impression has been made, some sort of wound or impression yeah. on, our, on our psyche. Yeah. Um, and it's real it's not imaginary yeah. but we, we um, it's too painful to be aware of all the time so we suppress it yeah. but those samskaras run us because although we can override them the power the effect of them because they affect our behavior they affect what we're drawn to in life where if, um, they affect how people treat us yeah. because these really what's happening is mostly uh, one set of one walking talking bundle of samskaras are relating to another walking talking bundle of samskaras that's and why sometimes you get a nice bit of friction that's why we get coronation street in these tenders <laughs> exactly where would these soap operas be without all of that all, all, the, all the all the melodramatic whatevers um and uh, this is these are the source of our behavior and how we feel generally our sort of background feeling uh, if we've got a lot of anger down there suppressed or sadness, you know, it changes our personality. So we can change our personality at that level. Yeah. And um, the whole basis of yoga and spiritual paths is actually um, to dissolve those scars, to heal those scars, those wounds, and gradually, um, and we try and do that with, you know, brief cognitive therapy and counseling and psychoanalysis and whatever, but they're very slow. Yeah. Um, and variably effective, I would say. Yeah. But a spiritual path which involves meditation and contemplation and inner work, yeah. um, and that's tricky. Many people are frightened of what's in there. Um, well, I think so, and I think uh, I, I agree. I think for me, uh, the meditation, uh, journaling every morning, like the first thing I do is capturing your dreams, you know, writing everything down and kind of clears the way for the day and meditation and prayer and things like that. Meditation for me has been mind-blowingly powerful, not only for the body as in like feeling like I was like a, um, you know, being charged in, plugged into the wall and charged up, even just 10, 15 minutes of meditation. You know, it's very, very powerful, but it's amazing what comes up through the consciousness, what, what yeah. little voices you hear within yourself that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And of course, I used to try and drown these things out with busyness and, and overworking and, and not sort of making time for myself. But it, it, it is a very surprising. I was a bit, again, I had, a, I had a lot of obstacles to overcome. I was like, well, meditation. I had images of me sort of sitting on top of a hill, you know, cross-legged. And, 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 but actually, it's, it's, you know, there's guided meditation, there's mindfulness, there's all different types, you know, whatever suits your personality. But they are really, really powerful, aren't they? Powerful in a restorative and comforting way. Absolutely. And it's really all about shining a light on what's in there. Um, and of course, when you have an aha moment and see the, the, the expression, know thyself yeah. with a capital S and to thine own self be true. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, um, it means that when you, when you know that, uh, it's, it's, it's alive when, when, you, when you find those things. So if you have an insight in meditation, 
as to how something is or or something about yourself that you may not like, that is the equivalent of shining a light on it, which dissolves it because those are the dark. The, you know, the, the only battle between good and evil is really within ourselves, although it gets manifested and projected out into the world. Uh, it is responsible for you know ISIS and all the all these things. Um, well, it's interesting you've been just talking about shining a light on it, and you know, and it, and it gets healed that way because I think as you mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, most people suppress their emotions or they have, they, they think I, I should be happy or there's something wrong with me. Because that tends to be, I think with the introduction of antidepressants in the 1960s and 70s, there was this mentality that if you weren't happy, there was something wrong with you. And along with that came, I mean, I think I was working the other day with, I mean, I'm sure there are more, but like 39 different emotions that we can have. But most of us kind of go, oh, if there's not, if we're not happy there's something wrong with us so all these other emotions are getting squashed down and suppressed mm. um and as you say manifesting themselves in different ways in our bodies so to actually allow the feeling of that's why i've been encouraging the journaling for for most people is just to try and capture those feelings in a safe way so that they're up they're up and they're out onto paper mm. um, and also just sort of encouraging them to keep it nice and safe through journaling because as they journal more there'll be more feelings come up to the consciousness, which they might feel uncomfortable with. Um, but, you know, not obviously saying they don't have to act out on any of those feelings. It's just, just noticing that they have feelings and just sort of reassuring. I know I have to even reassure myself sometimes. It's okay to have those feelings. It doesn't mean you have to act out in them. That's the difference. Mm. Um, but by just shining light in them, as you say, you kind of give them, there's a release from that tension. Yeah. I think the key is that, I mean, you can, you can, um, what's the word when you re recycle these, these emotions, um, if you don't really go in, into them. Um, and as long as they're in there suppressed, uh, they will be triggered. You know, somebody with a lot of suppressed anger will find themselves angry a lot of the time yeah. uh, with what goes on in the world, but they will also somehow draw anger. It, it causes people to be angry with them. So they get it mirrored back to them. Yeah. Um, and there are some people who, if you're stubborn enough, you can recycle that again and again for the rest of your life. Yeah. But um, if, you, if you're in a meditative practice um, and there's grace involved, um, there's something else there, then when it comes up and you shine a light on it, if it happens next time, it'll be less. And very often uh, you end up by just having a sequence of modified reactions and then it's gone. Mm. it's actually gone um and then you're not a prisoner of that anymore so that would apply to um anger um uh, sadness which can crystallize out as just general melancholy yeah. um, and uh, i've had experience of these things and i've seen it many many times where people have say had a if you have a samskara uh, of say five years black dog depression um it can actually be dissolved in in a couple of weeks it may be uncomfortable but it's nothing that's bad happening it's actually being dissolved and enlightened because what is enlightenment it's becoming less heavy yeah. um less dim less dull and brighter and more uh, and lighter yeah um I know it's fascinating. I think so. So for, for the women with endometriosis listening to this, they're probably going, oh, yeah, that's fine, Wendy and Tony. We know you're there, but I'm not there yet. And I'm still suffering from pain. And how does this relate to me? You know, I'm still in pain now. And Wendy's obviously helping me change my what I eat and making sure I'm digesting properly. We're getting rid of xenoestrogens, these estrogen mimickers. And we're about to sort of start on natural bioidentical digestion cream. But how does all this relate to me <laughs> how does this relate to my pain this particular thing that we're talking about well the spiritual side you mean the, yes yeah how does side? how does kind of how does that work because obviously it, it, it does take a bit of a transitional period i think if you're kind of used to being running out there in a fast better faster more society and then mm. you know you're you're trying to deal with your pain mm. so how how does that all relate to endometriosis in particular because i think when i spoke to you you very intuitively quite early on kind of made some um, predictions about my childhood, didn't you? I don't know if you remember that, but you did relate about, I think you asked about my relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, 
That's a very good question. It's not an easy one to answer. No. <laughs> I thought I just stuck you in that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you go back to one's childhood and you have, say, say you have two, two alcoholic parents, I'm not specifying this to endometriosis, yeah. which is trickier than most to interpret. But um, you as a child and you absorb all this as, as a reality and you adapt to it. Um, you need to survive but it's very stressful um, and you need to survive in a way that you can function. So you suppress all these, the fears you have, the frustration, the anger, the despair that you might have. Um, you know, why, for goodness sake, why can't they get along? Um, I need a mother, you know, I need a father and I've not got one. And uh, so you either blot it out and, and uh, deny, sort of go into denial yeah. or you become overwhelmed by it. But um, that stress, Actually, um, if, you, I mean, if you take this as a timeline, say a young girl with this, um, in, teen, in, teen, in teenage times, when you're approaching onset of uh, menstruation, um, that's an emotional time anyway, because your hormones are changing. So you become much more sensitive and vulnerable to the stresses around you. So those things are gonna have even more effect on you. Um, so what happens in the body? Uh, through stress, it secretes a lot of adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol to try and dampen the effects of those inflammatory things. Yeah. Um, and if you, over a period of years, secrete too much cortisol, what happens is that you get a, a lower progesterone because progesterone is the substance from which the body makes uh, cortisol. Yeah. Um, so then you've got a, a hormone imbalance set up through stress, but it's invisible and doctors don't test for this. It's not really thought about in this way, I don't think. No. Um, so they're stuck on the pill, mm. you know, to stop these heavy periods and painful periods and et cetera, et cetera, which is a, a whacking great dose of estrogen and a synthetic progestin, which isn't the same as natural progesterone, which are the two main yin and yang sort of hormones that run. Um, and run these things. Um, so both those things, adrenal depletion, because the adrenals will get exhausted, uh, and progesterone and estrogen imbalance will have major effects on the body of mood, of uh, weight, of um, immune system. Energy, energy, immune system, the, the whole shebang, really. Yeah. Uh, too much um, estrogen in relation to progesterone will affect the thyroid, so the, uh, your metabolism, metabolism will slow down. Stress stops the, uh, affects the, um, the gut and the absorption of minerals and vitamins. So gradually you can see a sort of general spiral down. Yeah. Um, and then if those things are still out of balance when you um, get married, and have children, then you're more prone to PMS, PM, you know, premenstrual tension, which is another great difficulty. And sometimes that can be really, uh, really severe in terms of yeah. both physical and emotional mental symptoms. Um, your fertility is reduced, so there's another, another problem in life. Yeah. Um, you're much more prone. You're much more prone to postnatal depression. Mm through lack of progesterone. And although at menopause, um, progesterone falls away to very, very small amounts and the estrogen continues on a maintenance level, there's something around that um, premenstrual period which, um, in which the symptoms, the premenstrual symptoms are much worse if you've been out of balance in progesterone and estrogen because they're a balance which is, holds a steadiness of mood and function. Now, this particular thing um, that we're talking about is, is, uh, is difficult because in this condition, endometriosis, you've got uh, aberrant cells which wander off from the womb, from the lining of the womb, and find their way to other, other um, tissues, like in the bladder or the gut. Yeah. And they respond to the, home, the cyclical ups and downs of hormones, estrogen particularly. Yeah. Um, so if you're over-estrogenized and you've got too little progesterone, it'll be made worse. Yeah. But the expansion and contraction of these cells, of these tissues, which are in the wrong place, can cause pressure symptoms, 
they can cause pain um, if they're in a membrane or in an ovary. Um, uh, horrible, you know, really, really difficult. Um, and you might say, well, uh, and, and we know as well, you've told us, um, and your little booklet is, um, actually it's more than a booklet, it's a book. <laughs> it's a small book. Certainly more than a booklet. Yeah, <laughs> It's like a, it's, it's, I'm only just sort of saying how how concise and, <laughs> and neat it is. Like like the uh, shelving behind you, all your books are very much in order. It's very good. Yes. <laughs> um, but you say, well, how on earth? Why would that happen? You know, big question. Why? Why? Um, well, this brings us to the whole thing of symptoms as as messages. Now, the the painful ear. In recurrent infection um, mm. thing is a good example you know that's that's a, a change in the local tissues and blood supply which causes inflammation which causes pain yeah. which makes you more vulnerable to inflammation with um, endometriosis well it's very difficult to say why cells would go wandering off but um, I think as far as I remember your your example was quite a strong example of this but the the most, um, I should say, explosive example of it I came across was some, not long before I spoke to you initially, yeah. um, which is a woman who was who had uh, four sisters and um, had a mother who had a, a violent. She was alcoholic. She had a violent temper, and she used to explode. And she was full of um, negative feelings around her femininity and about. Um, menstruation, about sex, about anything to do with the, f the normal feminine thing. Um, and these children, um, um, I asked, I asked, I asked, she, she was, the reason why she was so stressed, this woman, is she was basically the only one looking after her mother. And I said, well, what happened to all the others? Well, one was in Fiji, another one was in Tokyo, another one gone to the east coast of, no, the west coast of the States. You couldn't get as far away from and, her. And I thought, so, oh, and then I saw them as, you know, little cells as human beings and going, oh God, they've migrated as far away as they can from the source of the pain. Yeah. It was an a sort of explosion, that energy that they were taking on, yeah. aimed at their, the core of their femininity, uh, had caused this explosion, which was mimicked in which is somehow manifested in real life and you you can't deny these things they they have a they they have a ring of truth to you that well, I, think you for, I can still remember exactly where i was sat when we had that conversation you know, <laughs> and i just thought well firstly it was so nice to speak to a doctor who was kind and caring and actually wanted to hear and seemed to actually listen to me as a person and not just you know as a number wanting to be processed yeah, but when you much. mentioned that story to me i i related so much and of course for me at the time I didn't know that I was in a relationship that was actually very abusive. It was very subtle. It was abuse by degrees and it was an emotionally, psychological abusive relationship. But because of my upbringing, I didn't know that that was not okay. And it was actually manifesting itself in my body. I thought that it was me. There was, if I could just be better, if I could just do better and whatever and make him happier, everything mm -hmm. would be okay. But of course, what I didn't realize was that I'd, actually attracted a relationship of somebody who was identical to what's you know to my parent um so it was very interesting for me to hear that because i thought well i got away from my mother so i don't understand mm -hmm. and it was the start and it took me a long time really because i was in denial i see that now but i heard recently they say denial is a cushion for the soul my soul wasn't quite ready i wasn't quite there yet i i was searching and i was hungry for information and knowledge and i I, but I wasn't, when I spoke to you, you kind of cracked open a little door, a little chink of light came in. It's just like, hmm, that's interesting. So I think speaking to you and then do, starting to do meditation around about that time as well, really started to get me in touch with kind of what was going on. But I, heard, I did find that story fascinating because I thought, yeah, that kind of offers an explanation as to why would the lining of uterus start going all over the pelvic area <laughs> why would it? it's like trying to get away from something mm. something was right under my nose but i didn't or couldn't or wouldn't see it at that time um which is just yeah so that was that was quite yeah. enlightening. i think you could see it as a, as a magnetic repulsion yeah mm. 
so I, I was going to ask you about, I mean, it was, I loved how you just sort of explained the physiological aspects of how sort of, you know, from a young child, a young age, you could take on what your environment, your, you know, your social environment, your emotional environment, um, and then how it could manifest itself over years, you know, years and years and years, and then show itself as symptoms and, and, and diseases and things mm. in your life. But you know, we touched on, uh, or you touched on sort of progestion being out of balance. So um, what led you as a, as a, a doctor in the mainstream to, to look at natural bioidentical progesterone cream? It was one of those um, strange synchronicities, really. I happened to know um, a couple, and the, the wife was the niece of um, Dr. Katharina Dalton, who was very interested in progesterone and set up a progesterone clinic for, um, for women in the East End of London. And she also worked at uh, Holloway, and she did some research there, which showed that... Um, something like 85% of women who were there for grievous bodily harm or murder had done this during their premenstrual phase. Gosh, I know women do joke about it. <laughs> and so she, she uh, drew the conclusion, you know, and she, 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 she tested all the progesterone and everything and found from their symptoms, I don't know how much testing there was available then, but she correlated the, the two, the, lo the lowered progesterone with, um, with, PMS, and with the release of all these emotions. There's something about if the hormones are strongly in balance, then we can suppress these emotions. Um, but when we, are, um, when, we, when we are a bit out, I'm mainly talking about women here because men don't get emotional in the same way, of course. No, 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 men are perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have other ways. Um, that... Uh, when the, when the hormones are out of balance, suddenly we, we can't suppress them anymore. Some, some weakness appears and up come the emotions that are already there. Yeah. So, but they remember they're coming from the subconscious. That's right. So, um, and that's probably why some people can get really quite shocked by their emotions. They yeah. go, where did that come from? That's, that's really interesting, you saying that. I have, I have uh, talked to women who have said, well, actually, they were aware of the feelings coming up. Um, but they were often oppressed women yeah. and they said well actually to be quite honest I allowed I could have stuffed them down again it, that wasn't out, that out of my control yeah. but it was the only way I had the energy to do get my own back on their, <laughs> on their abusive husband or yeah. whatever so you know there's all levels yeah um, but you, you ask a question about uh, were you what led you to kind of start using oh, yeah. it yeah that's right. So I, I was already aware of that, but we didn't use progesterone in, in, in general practice. And then one day um, I was called to a woman who we just delivered, actually. She she'd had a second baby about three days after that. And the midwife uh, phoned me in, in some disarray saying, come quickly, I think she's gone psychotic. I think she's gone psychotic. And she was in a full-blown, what we call puerperal psychosis which is uh, someone who's actually gone mad. You know, they've gone there out of reality. Uh, mm -hmm. She was very aggressive. She was um, expressing thoughts of harming herself and the baby, and it was a terrifying thing. Oh, um, and normally a patient like that, uh, there was a program recently on it, um, Purple Psychosis on the BBC, I think, on television, um, would be admitted to a psych psychiatric hospital uh, in those days, they had very, very few beds, so the baby couldn't go with them. So, you know, then you've got this scenario of um, a woman who's going to be in there for months under, under antidepressant treatment, um, can't, hasn't bonded with a baby, and that's going to have huge effects later in life. The whole family's split and in trouble. Um, so I was trying to avoid this, and uh, I remember the progesterone. So I had a very, very good uh, midwife, um, who was willing to spend a lot of time there, uh, just popping in every so often to check on her. But we decided we'd um, give her some progesterone pessaries, which were said to be useful. Yeah. Um, and I remember when I left that the, the house, uh, I was backing away, holding my my briefcase in front of me in sort of terror. I mean, the sheer force of this tiny woman, who I'd known very well before, 
uh, it was it was quite frightening. Mm. Um, and then three days later, I um, I popped in and and said, "Well, how are you getting on?" And she met me at the door and she said, "Oh, hello, Dr. Coop. Um, oh, you look better today. You look really anxious the other day. What was that about?" <laughs> Yeah, it was because you were like slightly crazy. She had, no, she had no insight, but it it literally the progesterone through pessaries um, had uh, had a, a totally reversing effect. Wow! Um, and she hadn't really any idea how bad she'd been, you know. Wow. And everything was fine. So although one might meet one or two cases as a GP of that in your lifetime in your career, uh, so it doesn't come up very often. I always remember that. So when later I um, was offered the chance to do some uh, consulting around it, uh, I immediately jumped. I thought, well, this is really interesting. This is a really interesting substance. Definitely. And, uh, and uh, so then I found that it's got multiple, multiple uh, benefits and uses, right from um, PMS in, in heavy periods in, in adolescence to fertility, to postmenopausal, uh, postnatal depression, to menopause, to the whole thing of progesterone e estrogen imbalance, which is not well understood yeah. by the mainstream, I don't think. Yeah. Um, although there's there's a professor in London who uh, is mainly using it for delaying uh, premature labour, which is a very valuable thing because of because the of demand, yeah, you get more progesterone problem. and the body start wants to start delivering the baby. Um, well, if you if you if you have a premature birth, the neurological and psychological effects on the child on the child um, is is much more than we than we realise. So it's very important to go to term as far as you can. Yeah. So that's one. So um, and the reason why it's not, I should mention, the reason why all these doctors don't know about it or dismiss it is that there are some beliefs around it which are being propagated by, I think many, many years ago by some mainstream medicine professor, and it's stuck, but it's also because it's not patentable. So the doctors, uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies can't make money out of progesterone itself. Um, they have to, they had to make a, a synthetic version. And the synthetic version is other progestins that are in the pill and in HRT. Yeah. And they also have, you know, can have effects on the body, which affect the, um, clotting mechanisms of the body um so not 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 such a good thing no absolutely not no it's fascinating it's great hearing you talk about it as well and and i think i've been encouraging everyone to to really educate themselves read up about it because there's a lot of good information out there but unfortunately as you've already identified a lot of consultants and doctors for whatever reason they don't understand that you know progest progestins the artificial progesterone starts off as the natural progesterone and they chemically alter it so they can patent it and they don't realize that with that chemical altering that obviously causes the side effects but they have no understanding of for example um one of my ladies was told um that if she was going to be trying uh for for a child and she need to stop taking progesterone because it's not safe <laughs> yeah just like uh hello no it's not the case at all he doesn't know what he's talking about so and it's, they can see. with ivf treatments now which of course that's a big industry the ivf industry because of the xenoestrogens and estrogen mimickers out there and then the low progestion probably for a number of different reasons you know even ivf treatment is based around injection of progestion or suppositories of progestion and then when the, the women do fall pregnant they have to maintain the progestion levels for at least 12 weeks afterwards so again you know progestion has a lot i mean it's a very safe hormone isn't it very because in in pregnancy it goes to 20 to 50 times its normal level the reason why they think that is because they've heard some bad thing about the progestin and they've been or the progestins there are many of them yeah. um and they they don't know the difference. There is a difference between natural progesterone and progestins. Yeah. Um, well, that's and right. And I, I, I had to go up to my doctors. I had to change surgeries a couple of times because I was ultimately just hitting a brick wall where people were like, oh, well, that's, that's cancerous. And I'm kind of going, no, no, you don't understand. You know, this is not, you know, it's not progestins. And of course, unfortunately, the names are so similar. You almost have to have them right. written out in card form and show them up and go, this is this and this is that, and they're actually completely different. 
it, um, it's quite, I mean, it's forgivable up to a point because if it's not your specialty and you're just told by an authority, yeah. uh, it's easy to take that on board. Yeah. But um, as soon as you start looking at it yourself and making up your own mind, then it gradually comes out. Yeah. Um, but there is also, I'm sure, you know, um, a misinformation campaign which seems to crop up in the media now and then, probably encouraged by uh, big pharma and advertising revenues, um, to actually talk about the status quo, which is a, uh, you know, if we knew, if we knew how much pain and uh, discomfort and emotional trauma is suffered by women who could use this yeah. natural form um it's huge it's huge and so for women sort of you know who haven't taken natural progesterone bioidentical cream before how what would you how would you advise them to start using it well it's it's tricky uh, in, the, in the in the uk because um, it has to be delivered by prescription well they can also import it themselves as well well they can there, there are ways of uh, yes there are there are sources yeah. and there are some you know, reputable sources there are also quite a number of companies possibly who've jumped on the bandwagon and you you know not so sure well that's but, right you have to know the difference between what is wild yam and what is uh you know progest actual progestion um yes but uh, in terms of the quality of progesterone yeah you, know, you do need a, a reputable com company uh, but they are there um it's difficult it's difficult if it's a very simple case of estrogen progesterone imbalance then it's possible to manage it on your own you know with a bit of research john lee's books are really fantastic yeah. and there are other doctors who've written about it as well and there's a website which um i've written for occasionally uh, biohormone health bio hyphen hormone hyphen health.com yeah. which contains a lot of information around this and it's it's something that you gradually become expert on over time it doesn't happen instantly you've got to keep on looking but um what was the point i was trying to make um <laughs> yes, no just how i mean i think uh, what, what i'm hearing from you which is what i know myself and from only doing it's a very safe hormone and and i think what a lot of women feel a bit fearful about is a it's a hormone and when i first heard about hormones it felt oh, yeah. scary yeah. Yeah. but it's a very safe hormone and then of course when people start to use it Obviously, it does reactivate some sort of dormant estrogen receptors, so there might be a, a temporary, you know, increase in symptoms and things like that. But then, equally, if there are other stresses in your life that will, you know, cause more cortisol and, you know, affect hormone imbalance. If there's xenoestrogens in the environment, toxic things, that's going to affect the body too. So I think kind of um, what I learned in my journey, and I hope you back me up on this, is like you can take progesterone cream, but it's not a kind of a wonder all fix my whole life, my whole body thing. It's to be kind of worked in tandem with you know, your meditation, looking at you know your, your emotional health, looking at you know your environment, look at your relationship, looking at everything in tandem, your diet, everything. It's mm. part of a holistic way of healing. It's a very safe way, mm. but it, that in itself is not the cure inverted commas no, no. the condition no um it's true that you can manage yourself to a degree yeah. if your condition is simple but as we've already seen a lot of it is to do with stress is a dream to do with adrenal exhaustion then other hormones get affected and then it becomes much more complex and you have to have a lot of experience before you can find your way around that so it's easy to bounce from one sort of one point to another and, and never get there if you um if you're a complicated case but um the problem is there are there are not that many doctors who do this sort of work yeah um, but, but there are and probably enough you know you can find them um but as you say it's a, it's very much a holistic thing in that it's part of something and it all it's, it's a sort of wonder how it all fits together because progesterone is anti-inflammatory and the source of many illnesses, whether it's coronary artery disease or cancer or, or autoimmune disease, is, is a form of inflammation. So anything that will reduce inflammation in the body has got to be good. Yeah. Um, and you can do that through diet and you can do that through stress management and meditation and clearing out the samskaras. And, you know, you can begin to see the whole picture of health 
and it's it can be overwhelming at the same time uh it works well i think that's it i think like how you said it can be overwhelming but it works i think that's it when you we ha you have to have a a paradigm shift you have to have a, a shift of thinking uh, and, and it, that in itself can be a challenge because we've been brought up to uh, anything wrong you just go see your doctor you just your doctor tells you what to do and you don't think yourself um, and this is where um, I know dealing with, with some doctors and like yourself you're a tremendous example of just seeing you saw me as a whole person you didn't just see me as symptoms and this is what's difficult I think for women coming on this path on this journey now of trying to heal themselves through natural means is it's them obviously feeling into their body, them feeling into kind of what's, what's working for them, what's not working for them, what adjustments they have to make. It's them realizing that, you know, something happening in and around them, like somebody being ill or a death in the family is going to affect their feelings and hormones. It's like this whole window, this whole kind of arena opens up of wow. And just taking responsibility for themselves in a way that, they're, that they're actually in control and in charge of their own health moving forward of their body. But it's not just a kind of like magic tablet and then I can go off and, and trot off back to my, my lifestyle before or, or not deal with past or anything like that. There's a whole number of different factors that have got to kind of be filtered in to this mm. whole healing. Well, well, one of and, the and if you've lived your whole life in denial or busyness, as I did, you know, busyness and running away from everything, it can feel quite daunting and overwhelming to start with. But if you take it bit by bit and just do the little things, then everything, you start to build up confidence in listening to your body, listening to the signs, the symptoms, and listening to how it's responding. It's actually fabulously empowering. One of the pleasures of the work that I do is the number of women who've made, made a journey like you. And they've done it mainly on their own yeah. with the guidance crucial times and the key is I think to um, find something that you know is true you know know thyself and to thy own self be true and know that yeah. by which all else is known so your your core essence is the source of your creativity and in particular your knowing your intuition yeah. so you find something that's true and then start reading around it yeah. then you'll see a bit more clearly what will fit. So it's got to be coherent. And even though this is a very complex subject that we've meandered through, um, you, you gradually get a sense of coherence. So you can, you can relate everything to everything else. It takes many years, but it's really worthwhile. Yeah. Um, I know for me, it, I caught on, cottoned on during meditation um, that the body was always wanting to heal itself. Absolutely. And that, and therefore, well, what's stopping it? And that for me, I always got it sort of emblazoned a neon light, you know, uh, above my house going, the body's always wanting to heal itself. It's always wanting to heal itself. So that was just That's like, it. it's kind of like, well, okay, well then I can work back from that going, well, what's stopping it? Mm -hmm. And I think when I started to learn and read and, and hungry to get information about the body and the more I read, the more fascinated I got and, I don't know if you've read the book, um, When the Body Says No by Gabor Matty. Um, Not that one, no. Oh, he's, he's written a, um, in the realm of Hungry Ghosts as well. He's written a few different books. He talks very much about the psychosocial somatic side of things. So again, very much what you were saying at the beginning of this, this call of the social environments and the conditioning and how the suppression of emotions, you know, how they can manifest themselves. So I, again, I read all about the physiological parts of the body and then it was kind of like wow you know the chemical messengers and the hormones and how everything's all connected and the nervous system has imprints you know it has memories and and then you know and you really and actually you can tell by the probably fact how animated i am how excited i get that our bodies are just amazing and incredible so that's kind of helped me keep going and i think for my own journey getting to the emotional part of things was re was like the last stop that I needed to go to. But I, and I procrastinated and I went and all, all around the, the way because it was scary. But once I was able to, to um, go there in my own time when I was ready, it was amazing how much stress and how much release. And of course I suffered from the chronic fatigue syndrome and how that ultimately, whilst the, I was able to manage the endometriosis probably within about four or five months, it, 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 I was, all my symptoms had pretty much disappeared with the natural bioidentical digestion cream. 
the chronic fatigue still lurked around. It was very much, no, Wendy, we're not doing anything. That's when I read when the body says no. My body was just like on strike going, we yeah. ain't going anywhere That's until right. we deal with what else is lurking there. Yeah. Chronic fatigue is a really interesting subject. And of course, it, huge controversies in the mainstream med medical it's either depression or it's a virus or whatever. It's still, I don't know if they've got any further, but um, it's much think, better understood now, I think. Yeah, you know, Dr. Myhill in Wales, she did a test um, of a mitochondria score, which uh, she says it's not hypochondria, it's mitochondria. And, and that was a godsend for me because I was liaising with insurance companies and things at the time, and I was able to actually give them something in print to quantify, which I think it's... Um, there's a chronic fatigue disability scale that I think a, a Dr. Stewart had created. And it, uh, the score of the mitochondria marries up exactly mm. to the level mm. of activity and, and energy. So I was able to, you know, go to doctors and to the insurance company and say, this is real. You know, if it was down to willpower, I'd be up and around. But uh, again, it was interesting for me to, to see how what else was happening in life, my relationships and my past and everything was really manifesting itself. And it had come to almost a crescendo where my body literally had said no. And mm. I had to address those things. And it is a little thing, I think, that you can see it that way, that the body is, is actually overriding your mind. Yes. And I've seen this, that the main, um, the main types of people who, who get this are basically either super achievers, who are very focused on success and achievement and they won't let anything stop them and they get a, a real buzz from overcoming that. But actually they, that isn't, they, they, they tend to, they tend to um, be aiming down a path yeah. which is not their true path. Yeah. But they've been conditioned from often being part of a family or, or a dynasty who are very success orientated great expectations to go down a certain route and it's not until they actually and their body then eventually says as you say no stop yeah. and it's saving you from yourself yeah. and then once you actually surrender and go okay i can't live that life anymore and it takes a lot to get to that point very often yeah. once you finally surrendered then suddenly a little bit gradually a little bit of energy comes back and then you find actually that your real passion is sculpture or painting or something usually it's a creative thing that's right um, once you find that explosion of paintings and everything comes back yeah um and the other sort of person who who tends to get that is the um the helper the person who wants to fix other people make the world a better place uh, all, all good um stuff but um really does it at the expense of themselves yeah and that's because cool. they don't know how to help themselves because yeah. they've probably been conditioned in a family where um, that was the role. That was the role that they fulfilled and that got them their needs met in some indirect way. And of course, they don't know. And, and this is part of this is part of the exciting journey, really, for for certainly the women that are on this course is equally. I, I see where they're at and I've been there and. Um, and I know how frustrating it is and I know how impatient they are and they want it yesterday. They don't even want it today. They want it yesterday. And it's like, there's so many different things coming up for them and showing up for them. And of course it can be scary, but I, equally I know where they're at and I know where I'm at. And it's kind of like, you know, come on, come on, I'm just up the road. Just keep doing what you're doing and they'll get there. But as you say, I think, I, I think to know, to get confidence through gaining lots more information really helps people. I think if they're being told by one thing, say from a professional, a consultant or a doctor who, who poo poos, you know, something new to them, it can make them feel quite sort of inadequate or insecure. Um, but if they educate themselves, you know, by feeling into their body, listening to their instinct, listening to their body in a different way and whilst reading and educating themselves, it really helps to build up their confidence. Mm. And having an example, you know, you wouldn't think that you had ever had chronic fatigue syndrome, for, for instance, would you? No, I know. And, and I have to keep pinching myself because it's like, but you're right. I think, and you know, I, I said to some people the other day, I wouldn't change a single thing of what has happened. It was mm. absolute hell the past, you know, how many years that I had to go through. 
Um, I was desperate for change, but scared to let go and scared to hang on. It was that I was just wrapped up in fear. And I, I, meditation was incredibly powerful. And, you know, mindfulness, the increasing the awareness, just noticing without judgment. That was a really, and I feel quite emotional about that because it's such a, it's an area that people have very kind of, um, different ideas about some people are very kind of like oh it's a bit scary this whole meditation thing but actually as you say it's just you know enlightenment coming back into yourself looking at yourself and if you've been brought up in an environment where you've been judged or feel scared or criticized then that can sometimes feel quite a daunting thing but the very fact that we're on this path we're on this road says you know we're seeking for that enlightenment I think Absolutely. Well, Lou, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me. Um, You were very much uh, an integral part of my recovery. And as I say, I still remember uh, sitting on the sofa when you were talking to me in ways that were just so refreshing. I was hungry and I was craving for that kind of information at the time. I was literally going up to the doctors. um, I, I could barely function in any capacity going up saying, I feel like I'm dying, literally, and I wasn't being melodramatic. And they turned around and said to me, well, we've checked your bloods and at least you don't have cancer. You should be happy about that. So that's what I was up against when I got a hold of you. And I can't remember how I even got in touch with you. But thank you so much for um, taking the time. I'm sure the women will really love to, to hear and see this. And, um, it's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and rate us. If you're interested in learning more, you can download your top five jumpstart tips at healendometriosisnaturally.com and jump on the VIP email list. Remember to keep you number one. The world needs a healthy you.